Okay, so hi everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here for the second class of BioD25 Genomics. And today's lecture will be about sequencing technologies. So before we begin, I think it's important to uh, remind ourselves of how DNA works, because in the end, sequencing is really sequencing DNA. And you can't really understand how DNA sequencing works if you don't understand DNA itself. So on the slides here, what you can see is the structure of the nucleotides. And I'm showing here the structure of ATP. And ATP has got three components, like all the nucleotides. There's the phosphate part that is here with three phosphorus atoms. There's a sugar here, and there's the base. So for ATP, the base is adenine. That's here, like this compound. And the sugar for DNA is deoxyribose. Okay, so this one is actually not DATP. That's ATP, so that's RNA. DNA has DATP, it doesn't have ATP. So the difference between ATP and DATP is, is here, in these two structures. And so that here is the structure of DATP, that's the ATP that's in DNA. And the difference is that the sugar that's here, which is ribose in the case of RNA, is deoxyribose in the case of DNA. Okay, and deoxy, as you know, means that one oxygen is removed, and that's this one here the one that's in position two prime. So in RNA, you've got an OH here in position two prime. In DNA, that's nothing, okay? And so it doesn't prevent the elongation of the molecule because the elongation goes from five prime to three prime. So it's this here, this carbon that's here to this carbon that's here. And these ones are still available for making covalent bonds. This one here in position two, two prime, it's not really involved in anything useful for DNA or RNA. It just makes that particular molecule more stable. And that's why in general, DNA is much more stable than RNA. It's because there is a reaction of cell degradation that involves that two prime carbon that's here. When it's got an OH, it will degrade the RNA uh, autocatalytically. So DNA is a substantially more stable molecule than RNA. And that's just because of that little distinction here. But I guess these are things that you've seen before. So let's move on. The most important part of DNA chemistry is that it can be elongated, is that the nucleotides can be uh, covalently uh, uh, attached to each other. And so one thing that you really have to make sure you're, you know very well is that the elongation of DNA is always in the same direction. It goes from five prime all the time to three prime all the time, okay? And if you remember the structure that was on the page before, five prime is the place where there is the phosphate, and on three prime, there is an OH. So we always mention the five prime phosphate end and the three prime OH end, okay? And the elongation of DNA always works in the same direction. It always goes in the direction of the arrow here, which is from five prime phosphate to three prime OH. You can add a nucleotide here, continuing on the three prime OH that's here, but you cannot add a nucleotide there on the five prime phosphate. So that's a very important point to understand. And that's one of the key elements that you need to bear in mind to understand the technologies of sequencing. So all polymerases elongate DNA and also RNA in the direction five prime to three prime. And the reaction is, is shown here, you have a chain so here that means that the chain would actually go on in the, you know, it's, it's, it's not stopping there. It could be infinitely long there. And then this is the last nucleotide of the chain, of the single-stranded chain of DNA. It's got a free OH here, and you've got in blue a nucleotide, an ATP nucleotide that's ready for being chained with the others. So there is here an attack of the OH on that particular phosphate here, and that creates a covalent bond, which is represented here in blue, as you can see. And as you can imagine, that releases two phosphates and uh, their oxygens that are here. So every time you have the addition of one nucleotide here in three prime, one of the phosphates is kept and two phosphates are released in a small molecule that's called pyrophosphate that, that you often see abbreviated PPI. So that's the standard reaction of elongation of DNA and all the polymerases 
catalyze exactly that reaction. Okay, and I insist, absolutely all the polymerases go in the same direction. They all do that reaction. They never allow nucleotides to be added on, on the five prime phosphate side. That's absolutely a universal constant in life. So one of the most important things that we have to see together is the PCR reaction because the PCR reaction is, first of all, absolutely necessary to sequence DNA. So there's only one exception in which there's no need for PCR that we'll see by the end of this lecture, but also because the way the PCR reaction works really tells you a lot about the way the uh, sequencing technologies work in general. So we're going to go through the PCR reaction to make sure that we're on the same page here and to make sure that you understand the basic mechanics of the kneading of the strands, the kneading of the primer to the, uh, to the templates, and also of elongation, how that works out in the case of PCR, for instance. So here in this little sketch, we have a region to be amplified, which is uh, highlighted here in gray, and that's also known as the target DNA. And what you can see here on that picture is the first cycle of PCR. So the first cycle is kind of the most important because if you understand how the first cycle works, you really understand all the basic mechanics of PCR. So you gotta know these steps kind of very well because they're the essence of basically DNA metabol uh, metabolics. So it starts with denaturation. When you heat the DNA above a certain temperature, which is typically 94 degrees, but sometimes you heat it even higher than that, the two strands separate. Okay, like the energy between the bonds is not sufficient to keep them together. And so now you've got so much molecular agitation that they kind of go away from each other. And once they're separated, you can start to anneal the primers. So that sketch here is not particularly good in the sense that it shows the direction of the five prime and the three prime for the template, but not for the primers. So you have to imagine that the primers are not symmetric like they're represented on the sketch but that they really have a direction okay so the top strand goes like that from five prime to three prime it's there and so the primer that anneals with it has to be in opposite direction the strands anneal in an anti-parallel way they don't anneal like that of course they always anneal like that so the top strand is five prime to three prime the primer must be in the opposite orientation five prime to three prime so you've got a little primer that goes here and hitting on the top strand. You also have another primer that goes on the bottom strand. So the bottom strand is five prime to three prime like this with a little primer that's like that in the opposite direction. Okay, so that is allowed because you cool down the temperature to something like 50 to 60 degrees. Now it becomes possible again to have Watson Crick base pairing and the two primers will match the top strand and the bottom strand. After that, you raise the temperature a little bit again to 72 degrees. And because you use thermostable DNA polymerases, this is the optimal temperature for them to elongate the primers. And again, I insist, they always, always elongate in the direction of three prime. So this little primer that was there uh, indicated in blue was going actually in that direction. So it can only elongate from right to left. Okay. And the other primer that is here at the bottom is the opposite, it's going like this, so it, it is elongated from left to right. There is a question. Yes, that's it. Yeah, sir. So um, I'm just wondering, like uh, at the end, like does this primer end up staying with the newly synthesized strand, or what happens to the primer? The primer here. What happens to mm -hmm. this one and that one? Well, it's, it's a good question. Uh, yes, they stay. They absolutely stay. Actually. Uh, you know, like there's a color, like they look blue uh, and the elongated material looks uh, kind of, you know, magenta. But in real life, they don't have colors. OK, they are just part of the product. So when you think about it, every single molecule that is created during the PCR contains a primer. So the primer is the ultimate limiting component of the reaction It's the fuel, if you want. OK, so it is kind of consumed by the reaction, but it, it's still present in the product. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, so I, I guess it's not like your normal, um, uh, like 
like a little bit normal like DNA replication in the cell, right? Because in the cell, I, I know that the primer doesn't stay. If, if you're thinking of the, the way, for instance, uh, bacteria replicate is that usually this is an RNA primer. And so like mm -hmm. there are small, small RNA molecules that are then elongated in DNA form and then the RNA is removed uh, and replaced right. by DNA. Okay, so that's, that's kind of weird. If you ask me, I would not have de designed it this way, but I'm not the designer. Uh, so why initiate the reaction with RNA, then remove it and replace by DNA? I don't know. But in the case of PCR, uh, you use a purely DNA polymerase and the primer is not removed. Like it is actually a primer. You know, that's really the, the beginning of the molecule and it stays in the molecule until the end. All right, that makes sense. Thank you so much, sir. Pleasure. While we're on this first slide of PCR, is there any other question? Seems that no, so let's move on. So that here is the first cycle of PCR, and that's the most important. These mechanics have to be very, very intuitive for you. Two strands, you separate them by heating, and then you cool down a little bit. That allows the primers to grow on the top and the bottom, and then you increase the temperature to make the polymers work, and whoop, now you got two elongations on both sides, and you have effectively doubled the amount of material that you had from the beginning. Okay, you had one molecule like this, now you got two. So an interesting thing to do, and I really advise that you take the time to, uh, you know, I was about to say when you're at home, which was stupid, but you take the time to uh, uh, make a sketch of really what happens in the second and the third cycle of the PCR reaction. It's kind of important for not just understanding, understanding the basic me mechanics, but understanding the subtlety of the PCR, okay? so. We start exactly where we left at the end of cycle one. Now we've got these two products that are here and the cycles are repeated. So we denature, so now the two strands separate like that and we've got now two but now four strands. Uh, I've removed five prime and three prime but you have to remember that everything is oriented all the time. And after this, you've got again, the annealing of the primer exactly as in the previous cycle but you have to realize that the products are not exactly identical as the product of the first cycle, okay? So this strand here, which is in gray, the top strand, has again, so that's the, sorry, that's the one that's like that. It was annealed to a primer that goes like this, and that has created, again, a new copy of that strand here in magenta. So that's the one that we had already in the first cycle. But there is also that strand here, that was separated from the top strand and this one has also received a primer and that creates this new strand which is indicated in orange here okay and the same goes for uh, whatever was happening at the bottom strand around here so we create two of these products that don't look exactly the same as at the end of the first cycle and these ones are indicated in orange and we again regenerate one more copy of this one that we had already seen at the end of cycle one so the products are looking very similar, but they're not exactly identical. And then we go to the third cycle that goes here, and I'm showing only what happens to that particular product. But in reality, more would be going on. It's just that because the cycles are exponential, the slide would be filled with plenty of strands. So we focus only on this one that's highlighted here as second cycle products. So. Here we go, at the beginning of the third cycle, still annealed, you separate them as usual, you put the primers and you synthesize, okay? And so that generates that product here, which is highlighted as third cycle product. And that's the first time that we see a product that's fully double-stranded and that is literally flanked by the primers, okay? So you can see here that at the beginning at the left side is really a primer and also the beginning or if you want the end at the other side is also a primer every other product that we've seen before was not exactly like that it was actually longer either on the left or on the right so you start to see these products that are literally flanked by the primers only at the end of the third cycle okay and that's kind of the subtlety of the pcr reaction is that yes 
it is an exponential amplification of the target. But this amplification, like the final products, appear only on the cycle three. And those are the products that will increase exponentially throughout the remainder of the reaction. The other ones, the ones that look like this, okay, with the gray strand on top and the, the magenta at the bottom, you will keep creating them as the cycles go by, but these ones you'll create them in a linear way. You just add one every cycle. In comparison, these ones, you will multiply them by two every cycle. So those are the ones that you're gonna see at the end of the reaction. These ones will be a very, very tiny minority in comparison. So anyway, it's important to understand that the PCR reaction produces multiple products. Yes, that's it. Yeah, sir. So um, uh, I'm just wondering, like, let's say after the PCR, we take the product and then we do like a gel electrophoresis. And so are we going to be seeing two different bands or like just uh, one band where, you know, that would represent the final product? You see one band that has only that. Everything else is present but the ratio is it's just so small, it's so incredibly small that you can barely measure it, okay? We're talking of a million times more of that than the other products. So I see, there. so the other ones that did come like irrelevant, right? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, the other ones are not even quantifiable in comparison to the major products. So they're there and it's important for you to understand the mechanics of PCR, but they're not relevant. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Theodore. Um, so from what I understand, like the whole point of the PCR is to continuously make the same uh same DNA strands. Um so we have like a hundred or so of these that are made. Um would you say that they're all in like they're all the same? Yeah, so we got more uh millions of those than hundreds. Uh and uh, probably, you know, it depends on how much you push the PCR, but the numbers are, you know, they're really high. Are they absolutely exactly the same? The answer is no, of course not, because there are mutations. And if you have a mutation that, that appears early in the exponential process, then it's going to be carried forward till the end. So the evolution of PCR molecule is exactly the same as the evolution of life. You have a tree, everything has an ancestor, and so, there's divergence, like, which is completely random. And that comes from the fact that DNA polymerases are not perfect. When they elongate the DNA, they make occasional mistakes. And when we are doing the gel electrophoresis, um, like, how does it exactly look? I've never actually seen how that's done. Do they take, do they like take the little vial of the PCR of the, of the DNA and they put it in the micro pipette and you then you have like hundreds or different hundred like millions of different um dna strands that go into the gel like how does that work we have no time for this right now i think i'm going to show an example a little bit later in the, in the slides okay. uh, but <clears throat> maybe next time i can uh, bring you pictures of how that works but like you load the gel with your products of, of dna the electrophoresis pushes the uh, the dna forward yeah. and separates them based on size and then you have some way to reveal what the dna is so you need a dye which is inside the gel that will shine uh, when you put a blue light for instance and so then you take a picture of that and then where there is light there is dna so you know where the dna has migrated i think there's a picture later if you're still confused about that we can talk a little bit more at the end of the class okay. so one thing that is quite important is uh, th that we need to be able to design PCR primers. And so in order to design PCR primers for the, for the reaction to work, we need uh, the primers to do their job. And so th the capacity to design primers is really a very important task for you because if you're able to design primers, first that is useful. In a molecular biology lab, that's something you do all the time. But second, it really shows that you understand what happens. If you're not able to design primers correctly, it means that you're still confused about the way PCO works. And if you're still confused about the way PCO works, you're still confused about the way DNA is amplified. So designing primers is, is a good exercise uh, that I really like to be sure that you guys understand what's in, create, what's in create base pairing, the orientation of DNA pairing, etc., annealing, 
for that stuff. So the quizzes are full of it. And for me, it's important that you understand it. To design PCR primers, you need to sketch the very first PCR cycle. Okay, it all starts at the first cycle, so you always think about the first cycle and think where the oligos have to anneal. It really helps to label the five prime and three prime ends and to remember that all the DNA polymerases extend in three prime end only. Okay, so here, if you want to design primers to amplify that target, you really draw it on a piece of paper. Imagine, okay, that's the two strands, we separate them. We have the five prime here, the three prime there. So if the strand is like that with the five prime here and the three prime there, then the primer has to be in the opposite orientation. You never have a kneeling like this. They're always anti-parallel. So if it's going to be like that, it's going to be on the right side. And so now you place your primer here, and then you see what is the sequence that it needs to anneal to. Well, that's this one. I'm taking the reverse complement of it, and then I'm doing uh, the design here that uh, in such a way that it matches that sequence, and then will be amplified from right to left. I do the same on the left, and I got my primers here. And once I, I make sure that this is all going to work in the first cycle, then it's going to work in every other cycle. And the reason why I'm going relatively fast here on that, and you're probably confused, what, 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 repeat that, please, didn't get it, uh, is because I made a video for you, okay? So below is a link to a video tutorial explaining in more details how to design primers. So you're invited after the class, and you're not, not just invited, do it. It's really important that you watch that video and that you understand every single step that I'm describing in it, because you will need it for the quizzes. If, if it's a piece of cake for you, that's great. You know, some of you are already beyond and they, they have this under control, that's great. If you still find it difficult to design all the goes, watch that video again and again until you're really tired of hearing my voice, but that will really help you do that. So PCR logistics in practice, so when I design primaries in the lab, I do it the way I explain in the video, no kidding. I make a drawing every single time I say this goes here, this goes there, because it's so easy to make a mistake. But I do a little bit more than that. Once I figured out which is the sequence of the oligos that I need, I need to make sure that the reaction will work in practice. And for this, I'm using a software, like there are multiple, uh, options available that really give me a couple of key indications that are really important for me to understand that the reaction will work. So here this is an example of an online software that's pretty good at designing a, a diagnostic on your oligos. So you input the sequence that you think is really good and then it tells you one important thing which is the melting temperature. So that's the temperature at which 50% of your oligos are going to be annealed to their target. If the temperature is higher than that, the oligos will not be annealed. If the temperature is lower than that, they will be annealed very strongly, but you, you will also favor mismatches, okay? When the temperature is really low, then annealing becomes less specific. So there is kind of a tuning knob there that you have to know a little bit, and you're always trying to design primers that have a high melting temperature. Another thing that I'm checking with this type of software is whether the primers are annealing to each other. You know, you, you always think the primers will anneal to the template and that's going to be great. Yeah, but sometimes they will anneal to each other. And if they have the choice, because there's so much more primers than template, what's going to happen is that they will just PCR each other and they will kind of forget about the, the template and your reaction is going to not work at all. So you need to make sure that they're not annealing to each other on their three prime end here. This is a horrible primer because it will, PC, it will PCR itself, basically. It will even not care about your templates because it's forming dimers with itself. And once I'm done with that, when I've done all the diagnostic, I solve all the problems, then I go on a website and I say, I want that particular sequence here. And the price is not very expensive. We're talking about $5 for an oligo, sometimes even cheaper, like three or five. So oligos are really one of the uh, cheapest reagents that you can think of in the laboratory. And with $3, you have enough for one or two years already. So that's really, really cheap to design oligos. Use online software to check the oligos, the annealing temperature, TM is particularly important, and the existence of dimers as well. So I'm using here the, uh, the software from the company IDT. Another thing that you can do is that you can modify primers here. So you don't really have to use exactly the sequence that matches the template. You can do a couple of tricks. So for example, you can add a few oligos uh, to the oligos, so you can add a few nucleotides 
on the five parameter. Let's see that. Another option would be to say, what if I add something on the three parameter here? So I have a perfect annealing only locally because at some point the annealing is not good anymore. Like here, the annealing is not good on the five prime and there it's not good on the three prime. So these are called overhangs. So what's gonna happen? Think about it for a second. Is that particular case here going to give a PCR reaction that works? And what about this one? Is that going to work here? So let's think about it. What would be the problem in this case? What would be the problem in that case? Well, the main problem is that elongation always works from five prime to three prime. So here in the top case, the three prime N is really, it's poised. It's really like it should, ready to be amplified here and it's really annealed to the template. So that's gonna work, it's fine. But here, the three prime end is not annealed to the DNA at all, like it's free floating, and you can have elongation if the primer is not even able to read the template. So if you have added nucleotides on the three prime end of your primer, it's just not gonna work. Right? So the first cycle here is going to, to be okay. That looks a bit like a zipper that, uh, that you're opening. So it's going to work okay because the three prime end is clear. It's annealed to the template and then it can go forward. And here it's not gonna work because the three prime end is kind of, you know, in the air, it's hanging. And so you won't be able to amplify anything in that case. So that one works fine. And from the second cycle here, you will have products that are fully flanked on the right side by that primer. And from the third cycle, they'll be fully flanked on both sides by this primer and that primer. So in a sense, in that case, you have added some nucleotides in the five prime. And that's very, very useful. When you're in the lab, you do this all the time because it says that you don't have to stick exactly to what you're amplifying. You're allowed to change the nucleotides on five prime, but you're not allowed to change the nucleotides on three prime. Okay, that does not work. So when you're a genetic engineer, that's a trick you use all the time to say, I'm using mostly that sequence, but I'm changing the five prime ends just to match whatever my design is. So here, this is a little bit how this looks when you do the, the reaction. So to answer uh, Taylor's question. So here, that's, that's my FM here, that's my primer. Uh, took a picture of how that looks in practice. When you receive them from the company, they look like that. It's just a small tube, size of an Eppendorf, and the level of liquid goes approximately until here. And that's just like water. Yes, that's it. Yeah, sir, so I just wanted to ask like about the overhangs. So would you say that a five prime overhang would be more effective than if it had no overhang at all? Or uh, like uh, how would it be in terms of effectivity? That's like, what I'm wondering. No, like the reaction works about the same. Like the, the yield is, is not very much affected. It's just that if you have no overhang at all, you're sticking to the template. You're not modifying it in any way. If you have five prime overhangs, you have the superpower to change a little bit the sequence. So what could that be used for? For example, you could put restriction enzyme sites on these ends, which will allow you to kind of cut the ends in a particular way so that you can then clone it in a vector if you're familiar with how cloning works. So that's something we do absolutely all the time. Or you could actually use it to put sequencing adapters. And that's what we're gonna see in about an hour, that this is something like, you can't just sequence DNA like that. You need to know something about the sequence to know more about the sequence. It's a little bit like a chicken and egg scenario sequencing. If you know nothing, you can't sequence because you always need a primer. So sometimes you can do that in order to put universal primers on the end of your DNA so that you can then plug them in a universal sequencer. So these are tricks, but they don't really modify the efficiency of the process. Okay, so I guess it's more situation dependent, right? Like like, like you mentioned with the restriction enzyme side, like if we had something like that, then uh, the overhang would probably be a good idea. Yeah, it really depends on what what the question is and what your problem is. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Pleasure. So oligos look like this. They're in tubes. They're about yay big, typically in Eppendorf. And you prepare the reaction in a PCR tube, which is substantially smaller than an Eppendorf. So you can see here, uh, the tube is actually pretty small. It, it's, it contains at most 200 microliters. I know that you guys don't really know what is a microliter compared to a milliliter. 
but here there's a reaction volume of approximately 20 microliter. That looks like that. And that's actually usually green or red to help us see them because otherwise it's really tiny. Okay, so the tubes are really small and you put them in that device, which is called a thermocycler, but everybody says PCR machine, a common. And these devices have a plate here, which is in metal that can be heated and cooled. And that's how you have this cycling condition between hot and cold. You can see that there's an LCD screen here that typically has that kind of information. So it's a touch screen nowadays. You just say this one here, increase the temperature to 94 degrees for two minutes, then 94 degrees for 15 seconds. Then you go to uh, 50 to 65 degrees for 20 seconds and then to 72 degrees for one minute. And you do this 30 times. So you really have like an interface, which is super easy, which is childlike really. And you program the machine to do these heating, cooling, heating, cooling. And that's what, you know, entrains the reaction, the PCR reaction. So you put your tiny tubes here. Once you've assembled the reaction, you lock the machine, like you close the lid, you press play, you go for a cigarette smoke. And when you come back, the reaction is finished. So the reaction is run on a thermocycler, which takes one to four hours in general. And the results are analyzed on an agarose gel. And here, this is the way the agarose gel looks when the reaction is successful. When it's not successful, it looks just very different. And so usually you have a DNA ladder on the first well here. And these are products of DNA of known size so that you can know the size of the things that you've run in your PCR reaction. And you load the gel in wells two to nine, two to eight, it seems. And then, you know, wait a little bit, the DNA just moves downward in that representation. And after this, because there is a dye in the gel, just put this on a blue light and you got some uh, fluorescence that's emitted and that really shows where the DNA is. So that gives you the size because you have here the ladder and how bright the band is tells you the amount, you know, like this is a PCR reaction that has worked a little bit less well than this one, let's say, because the intensity here is only one third or one fourth what we see here. So that's the way in practice that looks like that. I mean, that's the way it looks on paper, in practice, in the lab, you'll see. It probably doesn't look exactly like you imagine. If you have the chance, my advice is go to a lab, try that. I know that these days it's pretty hard because of stupid restrictions, etc. But if you have the chance, hit the lab and try it for yourself. This is a fantastic reaction, fantastic exercise. Yes, that's it. Okay, sir. So uh, I'm wondering another thing right now. So like, I know for a PCR, like to design a primer, I, I think that implies that we already know the sequence of the, the of like, you know, what we're trying to amplify. Yeah. But like, what if uh, it's like an entirely new DNA that I don't even know the sequence of, then like, uh, is there any way to do PCR or do we have to know the sequence first? No, you, you gotta know the sequence. You can't, you can't do PCR on something that's literally totally unknown. Uh, but this is why we sequence the human genome. Okay, now there's never a case when we don't know how to design the primers. We've got all the primers that we want. You could, you could even say that the human genome in the beginning was just a map for PCR primers. That's really what it was. Uh, oh, wow, okay. But anyway, so before you could sequence DNA, how did you even start? You know, that's, that's, the, that's the question. Uh, so there are methods of sequencing DNA that are, that are not using PCR and these are old method from the 70s but they're using radioactivity and all that so at some point you need to start somewhere so you, you sequence a bit of a piece of a plasmid and then you clone the unknown fragment in that plasmid but because you know that piece of the plasmid then you're able to do a PCR because you can design the primers in the plasmid that contain your insert instead of the insert directly so that's how you would do it okay you just get the DNA then cut it at random and clone it in a plasmid of known sequence. But at some point, you need to know the sequence. You can't do PCR if you know nothing at all. It's it's really a chicken and egg. And the more sequence- Okay, you know, that makes sense. Mm, okay, thank you so much, sir. And I think uh, Tasneem had a question earlier. She put her hand down. Uh, Hi. Yes. Um, thank you, Tasdeed. Um, so my question was uh, regarding the overhangs of the pi frame. Uh, so wouldn't be the, a higher chance if we change the pi frame, wouldn't be a higher chance that it will PCR a different part of the DNA? Yeah, absolutely. So here in that case, 
if the three prime is not correct uh, it, it will not amplify anything here but now you can actually divert the primer to another site if this is a complex mixture like a genome that can happen because genomes have many many different types of sequences so that is not only not working it may actually give products that are not the ones you want absolutely right yeah but what about the five prime overhang here well um well let's be able to go and pcr a different part of the molecule because yeah. it's different no you it can go to a different uh, part but think about it if the if the five prime brings the, the primer somewhere else yeah and the three prime is not annealed to that somewhere else then it doesn't matter because but if it's annealed prime. then it will continue so if your three prime is long enough that this is specific then you're safe oh okay because okay what matters is not where the five prime annuals. This is really what this sketch means here. It's where mm -hmm. the three prime annuals. All right, thank you. Pleasure. Sorry that I, that I missed your question. No, that's totally okay. Okay, so here's an example of application of, of PCR. And that's something that we're going to spend a lot of time on a little bit later in, in the course, like a couple of weeks from now. So there are these things called microsatellites and they're highly polymorphic, which means that among you and me, we've got different alleles. So they look like this, like CTT, 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 etc. And they're flanked by unique sequences. So there is a sequence here, which is unique in the human genome. The sequence on the right is also unique in the human genome, but what's between them, that's variable. Okay, in the sense that the number of repeats of these triplets is not the same for you and me. They're not even the same for the two chromosomes that you've got from mom and dad. Here's an example with eight repeats, seven repeats, nine repeats. So it's the number of the CTT triplets here that's different in these cases. So microsatellites, this is the way they are called, are CNV, copy number variations, with multiple repeats of a di or trinucleotide. The allele is the length of the PCR product. You don't even need to sequence it. What you can do is you just Design a pair of primer around that uh, repeat here, you PCR it, and then you run it on a gel. And the length of that product is really the number of repeats, if you want. And so when you run them, you can see that heterozygous here have got two bands, like the, the two chromosomes are not the same, in the sense that they don't have the same number of, of repeats, and homozygous have only one band of double the intensity. So that's already something that's quite useful that you can do in terms of genomic sequencing by just PCRing the genome. So here's a question for you that I'm not going to answer. It's just when you're seeing this class again, when you have the time, think about it. How did microsatellites help in sequencing the human genome? That's something that we spoke about last week, uh, but I didn't specifically mention that they were microsatellites and that they work like this and that all you need to do is just a PCR. Another way that PCR can be quite useful and it's something that people were kind of clueless about two years ago and now everybody knows what that is, of course, because I think most of you have this thing in your nose already. It's the quantitative PCR. So there are two systems for making PCR quantitative. There is the cyber uh, or cyber green method and the TACMAN method. And the idea is that you're monitoring as the PCR goes, the amount of product that is produced at every cycle. And to do this, you need to quantify specifically the DNA that is produced. So the first method is to use a dye, which is called cyber, that specifically annuals to double-stranded DNA. When DNA is single-stranded, it doesn't bind it. But when you, when you have this double-stranded DNA, it's, it goes there and it shines. If it's not complex to double-stranded DNA, it doesn't shine. So as you produce these molecules throughout the reaction, then you get more and more cyber green going in the double strand DNA. And so there's more and more fluorescence in your tube. So you just need to measure the fluorescence over time. That gives you a curve that shows how much the DNA is produced. And if this curve is starting early, it means that you had a lot of products to start with, like a lot of template to start with. And if the, the curve starts to amplify only late, it means that you didn't have a lot of product in the beginning, not a lot of template. So that's the way you can say, okay, the, the coronavirus uh, here comes, comes out at cycle 42. It's not a lot. The person is positive, but didn't have a lot of the nucleic acid of the coronavirus. But if they start to, to come out 
at cycle 35, people will say, oh, well, that's, that's a lot of coronavirus in the beginning because it took only 35 cycles to be able to detect it. The second method is a little bit more specific because you have the two primaries as usual for a PCR, but you have a third component, which is called the TACMAN probe. That's the third component here, which you put as a target of what you want to amplify. Okay, so that's a um, little trick here with two ends, the R and the Q. R is a shiny molecule and Q is a quencher. And so the quencher prevents the molecule to shine. When they're close together, it's like, you know, a Superman and kryptonite. Like really, the quencher makes it impossible for Superman to, to do anything. So there's no fluorescence whatsoever. But when the two are separated, then the molecule shines. So what happens is that during the amplification cycle, the polymerase has got a, a, an activity that will degrade the probe if it's in front of it. It's just like a juggernaut. It goes through directly and destroys it. It doesn't, you know, destroy the atoms. It just separates the nucleotides, which separates the R from the Q. And then you can specifically have some light when the, uh, the target was present during the cycles. Yes, that's it. I'm just a little curious about the coronavirus situation. So let's say someone is uh, negative, like they don't have coronavirus, then uh, would we see like a flat line for the qPCR? Yes. No amplification. Oh, okay. Right. So that's in theory, in practice, sometimes the, the reaction has what is so-called primer dimers. And primer dimers, they, they start to amplify random stuff in the DNA. So you, you start to see something appearing, especially with cyber green, because it's not specific. With TACMAN, you can actually have a, a flat flat curve. Okay, so with cyber green, we might see some stuff here and there, but like it's not going to be like a well-defined curve. The person is negative, right? Yeah, you, you'll see an exponential amplification. It just comes late in the process. Late, okay. Because like it, it's random. It happens with a low probability. And so... Like you need to wait uh, a long time before it happens. Okay, thank you. We oh, another question. You're muted again. I was just wondering between um, real time PCR, Q PCR, and traditional PCR, which one is considered as more sensitive and more accurate? So real-time PCR and qPCR is the same thing. Okay, these are just, Q stands for quantitative PCR. Real-time means that you're measuring through the amplification, the, um, uh, the amount of product that you generated, but that's the same thing. Let's say there's, there's not really any quantitative PCR system that is not real-time these days. Okay, so it's the same thing. And PCR, if you don't specify that it's quantitative, then it's not quantitative. And in that case, well, it's just not quantitative. It's a yes, no answer. They are not there. And in that case, it's less reliable than a quantitative PCR. Can you say that again? So did you say uh, normal PCR is just yes, no, so it would be more accurate? No, more accurate is quantitative because you uh, can zero beyond yes, no, you can say yes and that much. So the two main technologies are Cybergreen and Tacman. Tacman comes from Pac-Man, this video game from the early 80s, because like the polymerase kind of, you know, looks like it's eating the probe. I don't know, guys are weird, you know, and they think it's funny, Tacman, Pac-Man, ha ha ha. But anyway, that's the way they called it. And so uh, that's the Tacman method. The fluorescence is measured every cycle, so that's also real time. So qPCR is also referred to as real time PCR. It's usually the same thing right so now we need to um to go into the uh, the relatively important part uh, of today which is going again through sanger sequencing we've seen that last time but it's such an important method that i want to see it again with you today so now we have the basics using the uh, the pcr it's going to be a little bit better to understand how the ddntp sanger method works so like the gist of, the, uh, of this technique is that we have two 
the oxy that are two oxy that are removed. Okay, because it's DNA, there's the one in two prime that's removed. So remember that from slide one. But there's the second that is removed, and that's the one in three prime. And as you remember, if you cannot elongate in three prime, you cannot elongate at all. So when you have a DDNTP with two OH that are removed, it has to be the last you put in the chain. There's no way to add anything after that because the three prime end that you need for elongation is gone. It's not, it cannot be used at all. So you can elongate as much as you want, but as soon as you got a DDNTP that's incorporated in the DNA, then that's finished. That was the last. So you just throw a wrench in the, uh, in the machine, that's finished. So here I've got a little video that explains the, uh, the Sanger sequencing method. And what I propose is that we're going to watch the video here. It doesn't really have comments, so I'm going to comment as we go because it's so much easier to understand that when you actually have things moving around, etc. instead of a static picture. So I'm going to launch the video. I hope it's going to uh, work for you guys. So let me cut the, the volume because there's nothing interesting here. Um, so here, okay, that's the advertisement, etc. Here we go. So Sanger sequencing. Uh, we're going to use J electrophoresis and capillary electrophoresis. So it all starts by putting a DNA in a tube and you need to know some part of the DNA. You cannot start with nothing. So there's a primer, just like in the PCR, but it's just one primer, not two. We also need a polymerase because the gist of that reaction is that is the elongation of the polymerase that's the sequencing. We need the DNTPs, otherwise the polymerase does not work. Okay, and of course, we need a bit more than that. We need the DDNTPs, and that's the one that will make the polymerase stop. Okay, so put everything like this in this tube here. It actually looks like this. So the normal DNTPs have a three prime OH. The other ones don't have a three prime OH. So when you have a normal DNTPs, you can do that. Here there's no OH. You cannot do the covalent bond. That's finished. So each of the 40 DNTPs chain is labeled with fluorescent dyes, each of which emit light of different wavelength. Okay, the DDNTP A, T, C, and G have got different colors. They not only DDNTPs, can they have a fluorescent dye on them that allows to say this is a DDA, a DDT, a DDC, or a DDG. Okay, and when you put a laser here, you would see that they emit different colors, which allows to, to differentiate them. Put all this inside an incubator here. It's not even a, a PCR. Well, I think it's actually a thermocycler in practice. So this is what happens inside. So DNA denaturation, just like in the PCR. Then your unique primer, there's only one primer, anneals there. So you have to know that bit here. And then you have extension. So it's a PC, it's a polymerase. It goes, 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 goes. But then look, haha, that was a DDA. So that's the last one, it's finished. Okay, you cannot do anything after that. Okay, separate the strands and do that again because it was so much fun. Okay, here we go. So elongate, 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 elongate. Oh no, randomly we put an A that is blocked. That was it, that's the final one. So now separate again and look that these are not the same molecules. Okay, it's random when that happens, but when that happens, it's final. So here they give examples where the last nucleotide is always an A. Okay. But it doesn't have to be only an A. It could be any nucleotide that's the last one. So here in that example, elongates, elongates, elongates. Oh no, cannot. That was a C in that case. Okay. So the first three molecules, notice that they're blue. And the one with the C is red. Because they contain exactly one DDNTP that has a different color. All right, we're done. We did that a couple of cycles, like 50 or so. We put this in, I don't know what, a cylinder it seems. And then we put that into a electrophoresis machine. So that's not a gel, it's actually a tube. So we separate the DNA based on their size, just like in a normal electrophoresis in a gel. And so here we go. The DNA will go from minus to plus. DNA is negatively charged, it's an acid. So it goes to the plus. And so here the DNA that we have produced are sucked up in that capillary here. And they will go from here to here based on their size okay so here the short molecules are going to be close to the minus here sorry uh, they're going to be close to the plus here they go fast and furious the big ones are much more slow because they take a lot of energy to move so 
they're going to stick around close to the minus here. Okay, so long molecules are here, short molecules are here, and we have enough resolution to separate even one nucleotide. Okay, they won't migrate at the same location. So here we go, there is the laser, and the short molecules come first to the detector, and the short molecules always have exactly the same size and the same color. It depends on where they stop. So the first was yellow, it was an A, second was red, it was a C, and so on. So they kind of you know go one after the other in front of the detector, and you measure the different colors here, and that is the sequence already. So that's kind of black magic, the fact that you're able to read directly the sequence directly from the colors really makes it super simple compared to other methods. Okay, so that's it. That's, that's the end of the video. The important point to remember and to understand is that it's the elongation of a polymerase that's the sequencing. Okay, like our reader is really a polymerase that, that kind of, you know, tells us what is being sequenced is what was the sequence of the molecule in the beginning. So I suggest to uh, have a little break now. We're going to, uh, to just stop for two minutes. We're kind of running late a little bit, so we'll try to catch up. We have a lot of uh, super cool videos to watch, but for now, just you know, have a quick break, stretch a little, get yourself a coffee, and we see each other in two minutes. I'm going to pause the recording for now. Into one, and we're back. So let's move on with the um, Sanger sequencing method. Typical results look like this. This is an actual result from the lab. So you just receive a file. Uh, it's usually you pay for a service. It's something like $1 per sequencing reaction. Like you ship your, your tube, they do all these things at the sequencing center and then they ship you a file directly to your email address. That looks like this. The beginning of the reaction is unreadable. You can see that it just wiggles with these peaks that don't mean anything, but suddenly like around, let's say there, then you can see that the peaks start to be synchronized and then you can read the sequence directly on it, just like it was in the video. And at some point, like from here, it becomes extremely regular and extremely easy to read here. So the reason why you cannot read easily in the beginning is because the products are way too small. So they can come together at the same time through the detector. Okay, you're not able to really have good resolution when the products are way, way too small. And the same when they're way too big, you can also have good resolution. So you have only a window of something like 800 base pairs. You cannot sequence anything in the first 30, 20 to 30, like that's really impossible, it's too, too short. And beyond 800 and 900, it's kind of rare that you have enough resolution to be able to distinguish, to distinguish them. So if we could go to the right, then we would see that it becomes again, super wiggly and bad as the, uh, as the reaction goes. So you have only approximately 800, 1 kb, that's the order of magnitude uh, that you can read in one reaction. If you want to go further, you have to put another primer and start again from what you've decoded. So another method, which is kind of using this, the same strategy, which is using a polymerase to tell us what's going on, is called pyro sequencing. And pyro, remember, that comes from pyrophosphate, this PPI here. So the way this reaction works is that instead of having these blocking nucleotides like uh, you know DDA, DDC, etc., the way it works is that we just put one nucleotide, just one, and the polymerase will be able to either incorporate it or it won't be able to incorporate it. So we just put one, we see what happens, and if there is some polymerization, then of course there will be production of PPI, of pyrophosphates, because it's a byproduct of the elongation. So if you can measure the pyrophosphate, we know that this nucleotide was incorporated by the polymerase. Okay, so we put a T, we just say, I'm trying a T, can you incorporate it? Oh yes, there's a peak of pyrophosphate, then yeah. So the nucleotide of the template must have been an A. Okay, next time I'm trying a T again, let's see what happens, etc. So it's just trial and error. And then you see, if you measure pyrophosphate, then it was a right guess and you know that the nucleotide of the template was the complementary. So at every cycle, a different kind of nucleotide is added. If it can be incorporated, pyrophosphate is emitted, that's PPI. PPI is turned into ATP, and ATP is turned into light. So that's the, that's the way this, this, this reaction can be 
sped up a little bit. The amount of nucleotides incorporated is proportional to the emitted light. Okay, so if you can incorporate a lot of nucleotide, the light is high. So why would you not always have the same amount of nucleotides incorporated? It's because sometimes you get two Gs in a row, let's say. And so in that case, you can actually incorporate two. So here, one G, one C, uh, you try T, nothing, bad luck, sorry, try again. Try an A, yes, that worked. Try a G, then you get double the fluorescence, or double the light, actually. So it means that you had two Gs in a row. Okay, next you try a C, again, double the light, there were two Cs in a row, and so on. So that's how this reaction works. So that's a little question for you to, to search if you're interested in molecular details. The A nucleotide is DATP, okay? It's not exactly ATP, but that's DATP. How come the luciferase is not directly activated when A is added? Okay, because the luciferase, the, the limiting component is ATP. So when you put ATP, like A, then why does it not work? So there's an issue with uh, pyrosequencing, which in practice makes it so that it's not used very much today. It's a homopolymers. They give a higher peak. Okay, that's what I just said about two Gs in a row, two Cs in a row. And from four or five identical nucleotides in a row, it becomes difficult to count them accurately because the signal saturates. Okay, if you have 100 Ts or 99 Ts, anyway, at some points, the light you emit has been capped. You cannot distinguish between these two. In reality, it's not even between 99 and 100. It's between four and five. You cannot make the difference. So that's the main problem with that technology is that when there are four nucleotides or more in a row that are the same, then it's not super accurate. So you tend to have deletions in that case. You say, oh, there are three of them. Nah, bad luck, there were four. You just haven't been able to distinguish them very accurately. So that's the main reason why this technology is not very much used today. And so based on that, really, everything happened with next generation sequencing. So that's something that started to occur around 2007. And that is kind of all the rage now. This, when we say sequencing, we actually mean how to put next generation sequencing. So what is next generation sequencing? It's just a reduction of the cost. It's nothing more than that. What you can see here is the amount of money that it takes uh, to sequence your genome. And so that's the amount it costs in 2001 to sequence the genome, like the human genome. It says hundred million dollars. In reality, the human genome cost more than that. Um, and so the cost kind of decreased relatively stably according to Moore's law until 2007. In 2007, something really dramatic happened and the cost of sequencing a genome just went somewhere about $1,000 and $10,000. Nowadays, it's considered that it costs about $1,000 to sequence the genome. So that's really what it means how to put sequencing. It just means cheap technologies to sequence. They're not better, they're just cheaper. So the very first technology that was used, uh, designed actually, is called the 454 sequencing. So 454 was the first high throughput sequencing technology that appeared in 2007. It is based on pyrosequencing in tiny wells. The technology is no longer used today, and the name 454 is just the, the original project number. So they had made a 453 failed attempt before this one, and so that one worked, they called it 454. So in a nutshell, you've got these really tiny wells that are represented here, and you put a bead, um, like something that's not much bigger than, than a molecule, on which the, the DNA is PCR'd directly on the bead, which means that every molecule here on the bead is the same after the PCR. You put these beads covered with their hair, which are copies, clones of the same PCR molecule. And then you do this power sequencing inside the well. So that allows you to kind of sequence short H fragments using power sequencing. And each well is sequenced independently. So that's kind of parallel sequencing. You're sequencing many molecules in parallel at the same time. And so the disadvantage of that method is that it uses power sequencing. Whenever you have homopolymers more than four or five, then it's inaccurate. So that's why it's not used anymore today. But, you know, it's vintage. It was the first. It changed everything. So in many people who are, who are using uh, how to put sequencing, you know, they have a thing for that method because that's the one that really changed everything. 
So there's another method which exists today, but which is not very popular. I've never used it, for instance, but I wanted to show you a little bit a variation on the theme of high throughput sequencing. So that's another video. And this one, if I remember, has got some, some explanation. So I'm just going to play it and music it. Next generation sequencing is a powerful technology which can interrogate many targets at the same time from just a few genes to all of the individual nucleotides in a whole genome. Ion Torrent technology from Thermo Fisher Scientific takes an entirely new approach to next generation sequencing, making it massively scalable, faster, simpler, and more affordable than ever before. The sequencing of DNA is done using a semiconductor chip, similar to the chip found in your digital camera. While the chip in your digital camera has a sensing layer covered with millions of pixels that translate light into digital information, an ion chip has millions of wells covering those pixels. These wells capture chemical information from DNA sequencing and translate it into digital information or base calls. The sequencing process starts when a sample of DNA is cut up into millions of fragments. Each fragment then attaches to its own bead and is copied until it covers the bead. This automated process covers millions of beads with millions of different fragments. These beads then flow across the chip, each depositing into a well. Then the chip is flooded with one of the four DNA nucleotides. Whenever a nucleotide is incorporated into a single strand of DNA, a hydrogen ion is released. This is how the ion torrent system sequences DNA. The release of the hydrogen ion changes the pH of the solution in the well. An ion-sensitive layer beneath the well measures that change in pH and converts it to voltage. This voltage change is recorded, indicating that the nucleotide was incorporated and a base was called. In essence, each well works as the world's smallest pH meter. The process is repeated every 15 seconds with a different nucleotide washing over the chip. For example, cytosine. A polymerase incorporates the C-nucleotide in the DNA strand if a complementary G molecule is present. If the nucleotide is not complementary to the next base, no ion is released, no voltage change is recorded, and no base is called. If there are two identical bases next to each other, two nucleotides are incorporated, the voltage doubles, and the chip will record two identical bases called. This process happens simultaneously in millions of wells. That's why it's often described as massive parallel sequencing. The ion chips help you scale the workflow to your research needs so that you can run both small and large scale projects without the need to change platforms. And the semiconductor approach helps you implement a significantly faster NGS workflow. There are many possible research applications with NGS. From whole genome sequencing to identify association of genomic variation with different diseases, to targeted NGS, where the whole power of NGS is used to interrogate a defined number of targets with possible significance in the pathogenesis. I'm going to stop it here. Music is way too loud in this video, that's very annoying, but anyway. So, the point is that it's the same, right? In the previous technology, it was using parosequencing, like parophosphate, as a readout. Here it's using ions. So it's got the same advantages and the same disadvantages. So ion torrent has kind of replaced 454 with the same idea of having these bees in the little wells. I hope you saw that it was kind of similar. But instead of measuring pyrophosphate, it's measuring ions. That's a little bit more accurate. But again, homopolymers are causing a problem on these technologies. All right, sorry for the uh, commercial uh, that goes with it. But these, these guys are the best at explaining their technology. So like they have this short snappy videos you can you can browse some online and find interesting stuff as well this is just one example of what's out there the most important technology is the illumina technology so that's the dominating one at the moment and uh, uh, really if you have to understand only one of these technologies how to put technologies it's got to be this one so that's the machine here there's no scale but it looks fairly like a little bit like that like a big computer basically so that's the high sec 2500 and the specifications is that you can sequence two times 125 nucleotides on each end and it produces approximately one tera base so one billion bases per run in about uh, sorry 10 to the 12 so that's 1000 billion bases per run in approximately six days so in approximately six days it sequences 300 times the human genome 
So that's the amount that we've gone, you know, between 1990, where it took 10 years to sequence the human genome, and now to say like every six days we do 300 times more work than all these guys at the planet scale for 10 years. So like the amount of uh, increase in terms of sequencing is mind numbing when you compare what was before and what is now. So here's another promotional video. Uh, I think this one has got some, uh, uh, some explanations as well. Sample preparation begins with extracted and purified DNA. The first step in Nextera sample preparation is tagmentation. During tagmentation, transposomes simultaneously fragment and tag the input DNA with adapters. Once the adapters have been ligated, reduce cycle amplification adds additional motifs, such as the sequencing primer binding sites, indices, and regions that are complementary to the flow cell oligos. Clustering is a process wherein each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured, and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over, and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, four fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determine the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index 1 read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the 3 prime end of the template is deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. Index 2 read product is washed off at the completion of this step. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo, forming a double-stranded bridge. This double-stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving the reverse strand. Read 2 begins with the introduction of the read 2 sequencing primer. As with read 1, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length is achieved. The read 2 product is washed away. This entire process generates billions of reads, representing all the fragments. 
sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the... Okay, we don't need to, uh, to see the data analysis for now. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's like a mini molecular machine. A lot of things are going on. It's actually very hard to follow everything. So, uh, you know, it, it's okay if you only could get uh, a, a few items, like you can watch this video again. Uh, the points to remember is that there's a process to amplify locally the same molecule, that's the bridge amplification, and the sequencing per se is actually very similar to Sanger. Okay, that's just like a Sanger in which you have a reversal, as if you could make the DDNTPs DNTPs again. So they don't explain it very well in the video, but that's what they do. You put all four nucleotides, and so they're DDNTPs, so you can include only one of these four, but after this, you unblock them, so they become DNTPs again, and you can repeat that every cycle. And, but the idea is the same, is that they each have a different color, and then you just measure the fluorescence locally, etc. So all these, these technologies are really building on each other, as you can see. And this one, it's just incredibly complicated what happens in that machine. So, as, as you remember, there is this kind of this lawn of, of oligos that they have in the, in the flow cell, and they need to anneal to a particular sequence, which are called the adapters. So this is what, you, what is represented here. There are these oligos pointing up like that. They have a particular sequence, and your sequence, when you sequence something on the Illumina, must be flanked on the sides by these oligos, okay? Otherwise, it won't be sequenced at all. So that's one case where I was saying the faculty of the PCR to add something on the five prime can actually be pretty nice because then that's one way in which you can have these oligos that are necessary for the sequencing. So every read must have a forward and a reverse adapter in order to go through bridge amplification. This is ensured by ligating a partially complementary adapter after the amplification, the strand that is sequenced first is random. So what does that mean here? Here, this double-stranded piece that is there is what you want to sequence. You don't, you don't know what that is, okay? You, you really don't have an idea. And so what you do is that you finish the three prime man by having an overhang, which is a T, and there is in the reaction this forked adapter that looks like that. So there's the five prime man here, the three prime man there, there's an, over, an overhanging T here. So it will ligate like this, this T will go there, and on the other side, imagine that you flip it like this and then have to turn it as well like that, so that the T is at the bottom. But when you, th when you think about it, when you have that and you ligate it, it's pretty interesting that the top strand has got, when you read it from five prime to three prime, it's first blue, then the sequence, and then red. And the bottom strand is the same because you read it from five prime to three prime. There is first blue and then red. So when you PCR amplify them using the blue primer and the red primer, what's interesting is that literally every molecule has now two different ends and one that is blue and one that is red. So that guarantees that it can be amplified with that bridge method that we've seen in the video. So stop and think using the red and blue segments as PCR primers is it necessary to reverse complement them? So here the burden of that question is try to imagine that you're doing the PCR of that stuff here. Do you use a forward blue primer or a reverse blue primer? What about this red sequence here? Is the primer that you're going to use the same as that sequence or the reverse complement of that sequence? So the bridge amplification has been described in the video. All you need to, to know is that it's a way to amplify the molecule in place. So it's a PCR, that's really just a PCR, I promise. It looks more complicated, but it's just a PCR. What's particular about it is that the primers are fixed. So it means that based on the way they're going to run that PCR, the molecules won't be able to fly away in solution. So that's just a way to make sure that once the, the molecule has landed somewhere on that slide, all the molecules that are amplified from it as a template remain in the same spot. So. That's the way it looks here. And uh, based on just doing the PCR, imagining that the primers are fixed on the slide, you will see that what has to happen is that the molecule has to, has to fall over. And once it's done this, then it can anneal to the primer and then the, the, the PCR can continue. So that's what they're representing here in this little cartoon, is that that will happen multiple times. And whenever you heat uh, to denature the, um, 
uh, the base pairing but the molecules will actually unfold like that but they're still attached all the time on the glass slide they cannot go away the farthest they can go away is indicated by the bending of the molecules. so if the molecule is very very long then the cluster will be big because the bridges are going to you know to go far if the molecule is tiny then the bridges are actually very local and the cluster is going to be small so here when you do that a couple of cycles you end up with having clones of that molecule in the same spot and after that you can use this modified Sanger sequencing to sequence that spot locally and you're going to use light just the same exactly the same as in Sanger sequencing to sequence just a cluster of molecules that are all identical because they have been PCR amplified so what's the purpose of the PCR it's only to boost the signal if you have only one molecule then you measure one photon let's say but if you have a hundred molecules you measure a hundred photons every time you have the incorporation of the nucleotide so it's just a way to boost the signal so that it can be picked up by a microscope stop and think why are the reverse strands removed after the bridge amplification so that's what they do in the in the um, in the video they say okay we remove the reverse strands why would that be important when you're about to sequence that stuff so here let's talk a little bit about the flow cells so cluster spacing is the key a microscope takes pictures at each cycle and an algorithm identifies the clusters and calls the nucleotides common issues are under clustering which lowers the throughput and over clustering which makes it hard for the algorithm to distinguish the clusters and reduces the quality so you've got these clusters that have been amplified by bridge amplification or bridge PCR they're represented by these these fibers that are here and imagine what happens if they're like uh, too close that's the case where this is over cluster so whenever you you record some light on the slide it looks like that it's like you know it's it's way way too close you cannot even distinguish one spot from the other and in that case you won't get a lot out of your sequencing because it's just way too many clusters close to each other and you cannot even distinguish which signal comes from that cluster from that cluster and so on so it becomes complete random noise if it's under cluster like you will have very easy time uh, sequencing each of these clusters and to know that the signal coming from this one has got nothing to do with the signal coming from that one but it's just that you're sacrificing your real estate you could sequence a little bit more and you get less for your money in that case so there is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where the clusters are not too close but also not too far so that you can have a lot of molecules that you sequence at the same time typically one cycle looks like that so the four nucleotides are labeled in four colors uh, blue green red yellow and you can see that when it's nicely clustered it looks like this and it's fairly easy to distinguish the clusters but sometimes here it's not completely clear for instance whether these are two clusters or just one cluster that's a little bit uh, disfigured so that's why over clustering is a problem so these are high throughput short read technologies and the new revolution the last one that, that came on the scene is long read technologies so the first method of long read technology is the pack bio smart technology or the pacific biosciences smart technology so smrt for single molecule real time works with a fixed polymerase in a well nucleotides emit a light that is detected only when they are incorporated so here's the reverse instead of having the dna fixed on the slide what you have is the polymerase that fixed and it's the dna that's going to go through it and it's in a well just like in the ion torrent and the 454 sequencing and so the dna is going to pass through here through the well and will be elongated by this polymerase and it's the nucleotides that are going to be you know incorporated here that will emit the light locally and on time and so there is a camera and a microscope that detects the amount of light and which kind of light like which color has been emitted in the well and that's what allows the dna to be sequenced but it has to be over time there's no stop like in illumina that's what they mean by real time illumina remember they have these kind of DD, reversible DDNTPs. so they have all the time they want because they incorporate only one nucleotide and then you know it takes what a couple of minutes actually to image every cycle 
in the case of pack bio that goes in much less than a second it goes really fast and so they need to record as soon as it's incorporated because they got only one shot after this the train has passed and if they missed the nuclear attack that was incorporated they don't get a second chance so here gets another promotional video i hope you're not getting too tired of them but again these things would take forever for me to explain with pictures but with videos I know that I'm overly overloading you right now, but it's still much easier to understand than with pictures. So here we go again. Introducing the PacBio SQL 2 system, powered by single molecule, real time, or smart sequencing technology. Here's how smart sequencing works. First, from any sample type, ranging from viruses to vertebrates, DNA or RNA is isolated. Next, a SmartBell library is created by ligating adapters to double-stranded DNA, creating a circular template. Primer and polymerase are added to the library that is placed on the instrument for sequencing. At the core of smart sequencing is the smart cell, which contains millions of tiny wells called zero-mode waveguides, or ZMWs, a single molecule of DNA is immobilized in the ZMWs, and as the polymerase incorporates labeled nucleotides, light is emitted. With this approach, nucleotide incorporation is measured in real time. With the SQL2 system, you can optimize your results with two sequencing modes. Use circular consensus sequencing mode to produce highly accurate long reads, known as hi-fi reads or use the continuous long read sequencing mode to generate the longest possible reads. All right, so that explains to you a little bit how that works. There's another video, which is a bit longer, that gives more details about this zero mode wave guide. Uh, so that's the second link here in case you're interested. But basically the point is that the molecules can be quite long but it's also because you sequence them much faster. So if you miss a nucleotide, then it can be hard to, uh, to get the right sequence. And then comes uh, one of the most recent technology, which is called the Oxford Nanopore technology. So it's because it's developed in Oxford, so they call it the Oxford Nanopore. Nanopore is because they really have a nanopore, which is a very tiny pore that allows the DNA to be sequenced. So that's the most outlying technique so far. Everything that we've seen so far is based on what they call uh, sequencing by synthesis. Okay, there's a DNA polymerase that elongates something and we're trying to just understand how, how it's elongating the, the, the new molecule and so what creates sequencing. It's all based on DNA polymerases elongating something. So that technology here is not based on elongation. And that's really what makes it stand out compared to the others. So nanopore sequencing works by forcing single-stranded DNA through a pore. The nucleotides inside the pore modify the electric current. Recording the current makes it possible to know the sequence. Okay, so imagine this, this is a pore, and so single-stranded DNA will go through the pore. So there's kind of a membrane, and then you force the DNA through the pore, which is represented here. And also they apply a current. So like there is a constant current uh, of electrons that go like from here to there. If the pore is really open, then there's a lot of current that goes very, very fast in there. Uh, but if there's something blocking the, the pore, like a DNA, for instance, then the current will be slower, as you can imagine. Also think that the nucleotides themselves, they have charges. And so depending on which nucleotides are in there, then the current will be modified because they will either retain the electrons or they will facilitate their passage. So if you calibrate very carefully, the method such that you can know which current corresponds to which nucleotides all you need to do is to measure the current as you force the dna to go through that pore and every time you measure the current you know oh ah, well if there's that current it means that it's these nucleotides that are inside the principle is different from sequencing by synthesis or sequencing by ligation we haven't seen sequencing by ligation nobody uses it today it's kind of a technology that's not used anymore so this one is, is really completely different from everything that came before, and that's based on measuring a current that is blocked directly by the DNA that goes through the pore. 
And I think that's the last promotional video of the day. So let's go through it. technology enables the identification of a broad range of analytes including DNA, RNA, microRNA and proteins. At the heart of the technology is a protein nanopore. In nature, nanopores form holes in membranes. In Oxford nanopore systems, the nanopore is inserted into an electrically resistant membrane created from synthetic polymers. A potential is applied across the membrane, resulting in a current flowing only through the aperture of the nanopore. Single molecules that enter the nanopore cause characteristic disruptions in the current, as do larger target molecules, for example a protein molecule, which may pass near the opening of the nanopore rather than passing through it. By measuring that disruption, the molecule can be identified. For DNA sequencing, Oxford Nanopore uses a strand sequencing method in which intact DNA strands are processed by the nanopores and analyzed in real time. The nanopore sequences whatever fragments are presented to it, regardless of their length, rather than generating reads of a specific length. This is different from traditional cyclical sequencing chemistries that deliver a set of data at the end of a fixed runtime with fragments of a set length. The DNA strands to be sequenced are mixed with copies of a processive enzyme. As the DNA enzyme complexes approach the nanopore, the single-stranded DNA is pulled through the aperture of the nanopore. The enzyme, shown here in green, is designed to ratchet the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The enzyme binds to a single-stranded leader at the end of the double-stranded DNA template and unzips the double strand, feeding it through the nanopore. As the DNA moves through the pore, the combination of nucleotides called a kama within the narrowest part of the pore barrel creates a characteristic disruption in the electrical current. This information can be used to determine the order of the bases on that DNA strand. The speed of the enzyme can be controlled. The faster it runs, the more data is yielded per second. The strand sequencing method sequences an intact strand of DNA as it passes through the nanopore. Nanopores have processed read lengths of hundreds of kilobases, and when a nanopore has processed a complete read, it will start a new one. There is no deterioration of accuracy as the DNA strand is sequenced. By preparing the DNA so that it has a hairpin structure at the opposite end, the system can read both strands of the double-stranded DNA in one continuous read. This gives advantages in data analysis and improves the accuracy of the sequence produced. Nanopores start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins. This data is pro... So that's about the data analysis, but you got, you got the idea. So the main novelty is that it's not based on, on uh, synthesis, it's just based on DNA flowing through, through a pore and you measure the current. So here, the, the emphasis on uh, long read technologies is that the reads can be much, much, much longer than Illumina. Oxford Nanopore currently produces the longest sequencing reads among all the technologies. Illumina reads are shorter than two times 300 nucleotides. So the max you can do with Illumina, which is a dominant technology, is 600 base pairs. You cannot really do more than that. If reads are too large, the bridge amplification produces large fuzzy clusters. Like there's plenty of problems that happen with Illumina when you want long reads, so you can't have them. They're really good quality reads, but they're short. And these here are read length, that's a histogram of Oxford Nanopore technology and packed bio reads. And you can see that it produces a small amount of reads here with ONT, which are like 50 KB. That's really, really long. We're not talking of 600 nucleotides here. We're talking of very, very, very large reads that can be read by this technology. Uh, the PacBio technology, in comparison, caps at approximately 30 KB. So that's still very respectable, much more than Illumina. But the winner at the moment is Oxford Nanopore. It doesn't seem to have a limit. If your molecule is super long, it will go through without problem. Now the downside is the error rate. 
So error rates are high for long reads. They're approximately 12%. So 12% of the time, your nucleotide is not the one that was sequenced. Insertions and deletions are particularly frequent. Why is that? It's because they're real time. If you miss the nucleotide when it goes through the pore, or if you miss it when it goes through the well, in the case of the smart technology, then you missed it. So that's a deletion in that case. If molecules are sequenced multiple times, errors can be corrected by consensus. And then you can go down to pretty good scores of 0.5 to 2%. But you have to align multiple times of the molecule that you have sequenced to be able to say, well, I missed it the first time I sequenced it, but the second time I got it right. And little by little, you can say, okay, like the whole sequence of that molecule must be that because I sequenced it multiple times. In comparison, the error rate of Illumina is less than 1%. Nowadays, it's more like 0.1%. And insertions and deletions are extremely rare. So short reads, basically, they're short, but the main advantage is that they're really high quality. Long reads, they're very long, and sometimes it's really useful, but they're full of deletions and insertions, which is a bit of a problem. So here you have a table that shows the different numbers, like for example, 12% of error here for the Oxford nanopore technology uh, versus uh, other kind of technology. Like PacBio also has 12.8%. So these are very, very high error rates compared to Illumina, for instance. Okay, so that's all I wanted to, um, to show to you today. So the key points to remember are that Sanger sequencing is still the norm to sequence clones. If you don't have a lot of sequencing to do, we still use Sanger sequencing. That costs one dollar. You just ship your DNA to the company, they do it fast, and then they send you the sequencing file two or three days later. Approximately 90% of the sequencing today uses the Illumina technology. So in terms of throughput, that's the, that's the best by far. Remember, like it sequences 300 times the human genome in six days, and it's not even the last model. There are models that work even better than that. The Oxford Nanopore technology impose itself for long reads. So these are kind of the key highlights to remember from today's lecture. So we're going to um, open the quiz in 15 minutes. And before that, what I would like to propose is uh, to do an exercise uh, that's going to be in breakout groups, breakout rooms. And the idea is that you guys can get to know each other. So it's going to be random, uh, random assignment in groups. After this, you can ask questions, but I would like you to kind of you know, try to work together in solving relatively simple examples. That will also be the occasion for you to meet friends or people that you can contact with if you want to do the quizzes together. So don't hesitate to exchange email address, contacts, whatever you're comfortable with, but it's not obligatory. Okay, if you don't want to exchange your contact, I'm not forcing you to, this is up to you. It's just to give you the chance to interact with each other when we're online. So here's the exercise. The standard Illumina adapters have three prime protruding T's. That's what I explained a little bit earlier. This means that one has to add a three prime protruding A's to the molecules to sequence before the ligation. Okay, you need to have this A here that's protruding so that they will match at the ligation stage. So the question that I'm asking now is what would happen if we modified the ends to be blunt? So we remove the T here on this adapter, but we also remove the A on the molecule that we sequence. Would it be possible to sequence the product of the ligation? So draw possible cases and highlight those that can be sequenced. Right? I know that this is hard to draw online, but draw on a piece of paper, show it to each other in front of the camera, brainstorm together, think about that, uh, that exercise. And then we'll, a uh, couple minutes before, before four, we'll get together in class again, and then we'll, we'll give the answer. And after this, I'll, uh, I'll answer your questions if you have any. So for now, I'm going to stop the recording. So if you're watching this online, thanks for watching. And uh, this is it for you. But for the other ones, we're going to continue a couple more minutes.